by the time I've launched the polls, I request every participant to kindly submit their polls as their feedback is very valuable to us. Shall begin. Good evening, all. This is Dr. Shubhi from Medical Learning Hub. We welcome you all to a live webinar on recent advances in treatment and management of latent and drug resistant TB. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce our eminent speakers for today, Dr. Shrija Nair and Dr. Sanjay Kumar Sinha. Dr. Sanjay Kumar Sinha was a medical consultant, state headquarters of WHO and TEP in Rajasthan. He is currently a work. Uh, he is currently a team lead for World Bank funded State Technical Support Unit Rajasthan under NTP. Sir has been a has been facilitated in implementation of services under RNTCP, presently known as NTP in Rajasthan. Also facilitated under the services of programmatic management of drug resistant TB. PG, PMTT in Rajasthan and also established three <coughs> CDST labs, four LPA labs, 62 true NAT labs, and 31 CV NAT labs with adoption of AIC practice in Rajasthan. He has also been a, a facilitator for establishment of 25 CV NAT labs in adoption of AIC practices in Bihar. He has published many literatures in the esteemed journals. I welcome you, sir, on our platform. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you. Our next speaker for today is Dr. Shrija Nair, who is Associate Professor in the Department of Respiratory Medicine, MGM Medical College and Hospital, Navi Mumbai. Ma'am is a diploma holder in pediatric medicine and certified in allergy and immunotherapy. She is a speaker at numerous uh, CMEs conducted in MGM Medical College, Navi Mumbai, and outside the, as well as outside the college. Ma'am has published five original research articles in various national and international journals, presented numerous papers in different conferences, including NACCON and APSR, Japan, completed advanced course in allergy and immunotherapy in Bangalore, and ma'am has been also been in charge and treating faculty of COVID ICU and wards of MGM Medical College. As for her memberships, she is a life member of National College of Chest Physicians India and member of European Respiratory Society and Asia Pacific Society of Respirology. Her special interests are based out of tuberculosis, sleep medicine, allergy, and interstitial, interstitial lung diseases and pulmonary rehabilitation. I welcome you, ma'am, on our platform. Thank you. As I read the structure of webinar, you have launched pre poll. I submit, I request all the participants to kindly submit their polls as their feedback is very valuable to us. After I deliver the welcome note, I would hand over the platform to Dr. Shrija Nair, who would be taking up recent advances in treatment and management of latent TB infection and DRTB. Our next speaker for today would take over the platform after Dr. Shrija on recent advances in treatment and management of DRTB. After both the speaker session, we would have a Q&A section for 10 minutes and a vote of thanks would be delivered and the second poll would be raised. I request all the participants to kindly, kindly stay for our post polls as the feedback is very valuable. The general instructions of this webinar are, all the participants would be muted during this webinar. If you have any queries, please type in Q&A section if you have any comments, please type in chat section. Queries and questions will be addressed at the end of webinar by the moderator. This session will be recorded and the recording email, uh, email notifications will be shared once the recorded is available. Polls will be raised at the start and at the end of the sessions. I request all the participants to kindly provide their feedback. I would like to take a moment to, uh, to thank our supporter for today, Beatrice. Beatrice is committed to meaningfully reducing the burden of both non-communicable and infectious diseases by leveraging our scientific, medical, manufacturing, and commercial expertise to develop holistic, integrated solutions for diagnosis and prevention of these conditions. They are also a global leader in treating infectious diseases such as HIV-AIDS, 
hepatitis, and tuberculosis, and offer an extensive portfolio across these disease states. From manufacturing a pediatric-friendly enteroviral used to treat HIV-positive infants and to provide HIV cell tests in some low- and middle-income countries, Beatrice is innovating to help patients. With this, I would like to stop sharing my screen and hand over the platform to Dr. Srijana. Thank you, ma'am. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Shubhi. I'll just share my screen. Um, the screen is visible, ma'am. Yeah, one second. I hope this is visible and yes, I'm audible too, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, very good evening to all of you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Shubhi and uh, the organizers at MLH uh, for inviting me to uh, give this talk. I'm Dr. Shrija. I'm an associate professor in a medical college in Navi Mumbai, and I will be talking on a um, little, um, uh, you know, a uh, it's, it's, it's a topic that we pulmonologists often have a disagreement upon. This is the recent advances in the treatment and management of latent TB infection. I'll be dealing with the drug sensitive part and Sir will be dealing with the drug resistant part. So let's start. So what is latent TB? Um, now latent TB or tuberculosis infection as now quoted by the guidelines is a state of persistent immune response to stimulation by M tuberculosis antigens. However, these patients have no evidence of clinically manifest TB disease. So this means the patient has uh, the bacteria within the body, but does not exhibit any signs or symptoms of the tuberculosis diseases in, in any form, be it pulmonary or extrapulmonary. Now, there is no gold standard test for the direct identification of the MTB infection. All the tests that we have are indirect tests based on the patient's immuno immunology. And as, although majority of the infected patients don't have signs and symptoms of TB, they are at risk for developing TB disease. And that's why we consider treatment for latent TB in such patients. So just a quick uh, run through of what happens in, when a patient gets infected with TB. So a patient gets exposed to a, a, a pulmonary um, a patient, a pulmonary cox patient, that is a patient who coughs out the bacilli. So out of the 100% of the 100 people who are infected, 5 to 10% develop the primary disease straight away. And about 90 to 95% go into a state of latent TB infection. That means these patients have got the bacteria within them. And out of this 95%, 5 to 10% of these patients react activate and develop the disease within the next one to two years, and the rest 90 of them contain the infection or try to get rid of the infection. So what, what is the importance of this? Now, the importance, especially in our country, is because we have the highest burden of tuberculosis in the world, and about 26 um, lakh of population develop this disease every year. And 35 to 40 um, uh, crore population, that is 100,000 persons, have latent TB I that is a latent TB infection, and five to 10% of them will develop TB disease in some form or the other in the next one to two years of acquiring the TB infection. And the greatest predictor of this progression to disease from an, immunolog from an um, uh, infection state is the immunological status of the patient. So the risk is 25 times more in close contacts of sputum positive patients, and it's 16 to 21 times more in HIV positive individuals four times in other immunocompromised states such as diabetes, mellitus, chronic kidney disease, patients of cancer, etc. cetera. Um, sorry. Yeah, so now the early, uh, the top priority of managing tuberculosis at a community and the individual level is of course, based on the early diagnosis and treatment of the active uh, TB cases. However, by preventing TB, by finding and treating latent TB or TBI and active case finding among the high risk groups are extremely important steps also towards ending tuberculosis. And that's what is being done in developed nations where the incidence has come quite low of TB. Now the risk of developing TB disease after the uh, the, the TB prophylactic therapy or the, um, uh, the prophylactic therapy for TB, it decreases by approximately 60% and the reduction can even be seen up to 90% among people living with HIV. Now, this is a study that was done in Tamil Nadu in India in 2019. Um, uh, and the first study that I quoted, the 60% is a study that was done in the Western region. So based on all this, we have the TPT um, uh, guidelines. Now, epidemiological modeling studies also show that there's an effective implementation of TPT alone in Southeast Asian region that would result in an annual decline of the TB incidence by 8.3%. This is independent of other background interventions that we may do. 
Now, this is the national strategic plan of the government, which um, uh, it's an ambitious plan to eliminate TB by 2025, which um, as clinicians, we know it's quite easier said than done. So we have four, four pillars of this uh, NSP, the national strategic plan, that is to detect, treat and build um, the, you know, the program in such a way so that TB can be eliminated by 2025. And prevention is the fourth pillar of this plan. So there's a cascade of care approach that is written. Now, most of the, my slides are taken from these guidelines, I have to admit. This is the guidelines of programmatic management of TB preventive treatment, that is TPT, TB preventive treatment in India, which was released in June 2021. And this is freely downloadable from the National Tuberculosis Elimination Program website. So you have a target population. The target population is a set of persons who are at high risk of developing tuberculosis uh, who, have, who may have TB infection. So such population, such population, we must rule out active TB. This is a term that I will keep repeating over and over again. In every patient, you must rule out active TB. So if the patient, active TB is ruled out, the patient doesn't have signs and symptoms of TB, then you test for the TB infection as per the policy guidelines, and then evaluate the patient for TPT, whether he can actually be given these medications. If so, then we start the TPT and keep a routine follow-up of such patients. If the patient has signs and symptoms of active TB, he's a presumptive TB case, and then you have to rule out active TB. If it's confirmed, then you start the treatment for tuberculosis. So what is the target population for TPT? Persons at highest risk of progression to active TB. These are the uh, target population. So this includes people living with HIV. That means adults and children over the year, over the age of 12, or infants who are in contact with an active pulmonary TB patient. Help, uh, household contacts below and above five years uh, who are contacts of pulmonary TB, and individuals on immunosuppressive therapy, individuals who are uh, on you know on the waiting list for transplant, patients of silicosis, and patients of hemodialysis. So this is a strategy for target population as per the guidelines um, of um, programmatic management of TB preventive treatment. So you have the target population of people living with HIV or pe people on ART, that is antiretroviral therapy, that is adults and children over 12 months or infants with, uh, with HIV who are in contact with an active pulmonary TB case or household contacts below the age of five years um, of pulmonary TB patients. In all these patients, you must give TPT after ruling out active TB disease. And in household contacts of five years and above of pulmonary TB patients, you must give the TB preventive treatment among the patients who have evidence of later TB um, with tests. And after, of course, ruling out active TB disease. So now the other set of target population are patients on immunosuppressive therapy, patients with silicosis, patients on anti-TNF treatment, on dialysis, or patients preparing for organ or hematological transplantation. In such patients, again, you must rule out the active infection and do the test and then give TB preventive treatment. So TBI testing and treatment is not recommended for patients with diabetes, mellitus, malnutrition, smoking, harmful alcohol abuse, because the risk is a little lower than as compared to the other target population. So unless these patients have other risk factors, risk factors such as HIV infection or history of contact with a TB patient, we will not suggest giving TPT in such patients. Active case finding has to be done in high transmission settings. Those are um, healthcare workers, prisons, mines, slums, tribal and migrant laborers, etc. And these people must be prioritized for specific TPT interventions guided by differential TB epidemiology by the state TPT committee if the risk of active TB among them is higher than that of the general population in the respective states. So how do we diagnose um, latent TB or TB infection, like I said before, there is no gold standard for diagnosis of TBI or for assessing the progression of these patients to disease. So currently the available tests are indirect and uh, indirect tests and they measure the immune response following TB exposure, requiring an individual to mount an adequate immune response to provide the reliable results. So uh, as most of us know, the available tests we have are the MONTU test or the tuberculin skin test and the interferon gamma release assays, IGRA. Now both tests measure the immune sensitization that is a delayed type for or a delayed type 2 hypersensitivity response. This is a, um, a picture showing the tuberculin since uh, skin test. As we know, it's a test that is done in the bowler aspect of usually the left forearm. And we use a PPD, that's a purified protein derivative of about two, about five or two tuberculin units, which is injected in the bowler forearm. And a wheel is created. This wheel is red now after um, 48 to 72 hours. And the based on the largest diameter of this wheel, you measure and give a report. Okay, so now, 
But the most common finding to say it's a positive result is something more than 10 mm, which is seen in recent arrivals from a high prevalence country, patients of IV drug users, patients who live in high congregate settings of TB, uh, persons who work in a mycobacterial lab or healthcare workers, and patients with comorbid conditions in children less than four years. However, if it's just 5 mm, it may be positive and considered significant in patients of HIV, patients of recent contact with active TB infection, patients who have all changes of TB on the chest X-ray, and patients with organ transplant. If it's highly positive, that is more than 15 mm, this is seen in persons with known risk factors of TB, so this is significant. However, this is just to mention that these tests are not used for diagnosing TB per se. It's not used for active TB. It may give you corroboratory evidence, but it's only used in the uh, you know, diagnosis or management of LTB. It's not used for active TB, nor is it used to see the progression of the disease. What are interferon gamma release assays? IGRA or interferon gamma release assays measure the amount of interferon gamma released in vitro by white blood cells when mixed with antigens that are found in MTB, but not in BCG vaccine and non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Now, this is where the IGRA differs from a TSD or a MONTU test, because MONTU tests may also be found, uh, may come positive in patients who have NTM or patients who are recently vaccinated with BCG. So this is done through enumeration of interferon gamma secreting T cells. This is LA spot test or um, by ELISA method where the measurement of interferon gamma concentration is seen. These are more specific than the tuberculin set, uh, skin test as they're not confounded by the previous BCG vaccination and NTM. And ELISA has a similar sensitivity to the TSD, whereas LA spot seems to be more sensitive. So using the degree of exposure to TB as a surrogate for LTBI, both assays correlate at least as well with TB exposure as TSD. And now there are recent studies that are going on which show that there's a prognostic power of positive IGRA results in recent contacts for subsequent progression of active disease. But as of now, we do not use this for active disease. I just want to make myself clear on that point. This is just a diagram showing both of them. As you can see, the two-based method where you have a quantified um, result is seen in quantifier and gold. T-spot TB is based on the uh, done through the enumeration of the lymphocytes. So these are small cartridges in which you get a positive test. But the result is almost the same in both of them. It depends. Some areas have both. And in India, a quantifying gold is more easily available. And the cost ranges from somewhere between 1500 to 2500 per test. So a quick um, uh, comparison. So I think we've uh, said most of this now. The specificity is low in BCG vaccinated TSD. It's high in IGRA. The sensitivity is high in both of them. TSD is more field friendly. So you can take it into the field and do a mass test on the community, whereas IGRA is you need lab and infrastructure. So that makes it more costly than a TSD. But however, TSD is a complex old product and you need to you know have a person who can read the interpret the results properly. And it's um, affected by young age in both uh, the tests. And person living with HIV, um, the IGRA may show a lower sensitivity because the HIV and the low CD4 count, because of the low CD4 count in HIV patients. So enumeration and contact tracing of target population needs to be uh, proactively undertaken by the healthcare providers. Now this can be healthcare providers anywhere. It may be in a health center, it may be an ICTC center, ART centers, it may be in institutions providing care to a specific risk population. Um, and these patients who are uh, considered eligible for the TPT using the Pre Prevent TB India app. Now there is a Prevent TB India app that will be soon available, which is you know, um, it, it, it's there in iOS as well as Android. And this will give you information management and monitoring of TPT and the care cascade as mentioned before. So index TB patients are pulmonary TB patients that are detected through passive, intensified or active case finding approaches and notified in the NICSHE from the public and private sector. And contact tracing must be done during home, initial home visits or virtual interactions through tele or video consults by the healthcare workers with the family or close contacts for enumeration, counseling, screening, and encouraging eligible health, um, household contacts for TPT initiation at hospitals or healthcare facilities. Basically, you have to involve the family in this. You have to involve all the healthcare workers, be it nurses, be it healthcare providers. It can be anybody who is willing to take on this responsibility. But at the end of the day, the guideline says, says that the onus lies on the treating doctor. So how does it go? So we have the target population of HIV positive, the household contact, and other high-risk groups. As mentioned, HIV positive, any symptom, any concurrent cough, fever, weight loss, or night sweats, these are the four cardinal symptoms. If this is present, then you have to obviously investigate for active TB. I would mention over here, even though the guideline doesn't say, so it, in spite, just uh, apart from these symptoms, you also have to look for other signs of extrapulmonary TB. That means you have to ask for significant fatigue. You have to see, check for any axillary or um, cervical 
cervical or inguinal lymph nodes in these patients, and if possible, even get an ultrasound abdomen done other than just an x-ray to rule out active disease. So if it's not contraindicated, we start the P uh, TPT in such patients. In household contacts and symptomatic cases, obviously we have to work up for active TB. If they're not um, symptomatic, then you look at the age of the patient. If it's less than five years, automatically the patient gets treatment for TPT. If not, if the patient is more than five years, you go ahead and do a TST or an IGRA. If it is positive or if it's not possible to do it and you have ruled out TB for sure, active TB, then you start preventive treatment. If it's negative, you're ideally supposed to keep a follow-up. And now it's not very clear how frequently we have to check, but at least every six months, the patient has to come to you and uh, you have to check whether the patient has developed active disease or not. So how do we counsel these patients eligible for TPT? So anyone involved in the treatment of the index case and eligible patient can counsel the patient. You have to ensure in confidentiality when seeking the patient's commitment to complete the course and ensure that the patient understands the role of TPT regimen options and the duration required to complete it. You have to provide information materials in the local language and the appropriate literacy level of the patient. It more family members and health caregivers and health education whenever it's possible. Reinforce, reinforce the supportive educational messages at each contact during treatment. And clear information regarding the adverse drug reactions is very important, and you have to tell the patient to spot the triggers of such um, side effects. And of course, ask questions and provide clear and simple answers to their questions. And of course, CPT at the moment is not mandatory. You have to give a choice to the patient. And they have to, I would suggest take a consent from the patient that he understands and he's willing to adhere to this treatment for the uh, for the said time. And of course, please provide a, a telephone number of the healthcare worker staff, whoever can help the patient. Uh, the Nikshish Sampark has a toll-free number. This is 1811-6666, which may be provided to index TB patients and, and patients whose uh, family started on TPT. So that this serves as a resource for any time information. This is a toll-free number. They can get information, counseling, any troubleshooting if required, um, so that we can enable TB, TPT initiation, proper follow-up monitoring, and completion. So initiating the TPT. Now, once you decided that you want to give this to a patient, what do you do? You have to, first of all, uh, find out the contraindications. Again, saying this, uh, reiterating it over and over again, rule out active TB disease. Once this is done, you know that the patient doesn't have any signs of TB disease. If the patient doesn't have active hepatitis, active um, evidence of peripheral neuropathy, and if a patient is not an alcoholic or had, doesn't have history of excessive alcohol consumption, you may start the treatment. Why is active hepatitis and peripheral neuropathy important because INH causes, it's a very strong side effect of uh, isoniazid and even the rifamycin, which I'm going to talk about later. So the medicines will be available for free in all the uh, government centers, dot centers across the country. It's, uh, it's being rolled out in a phase-like manner, but it will be available. The pre-treatment assessment for TPT initiation includes personal, social, financial, and medication history. Medication history is very important because there are a lot of drug interactions that we'll talk about and also investigation as per the NTP uh, guidelines. Now, things like liver function test is not mandatory, but I would suggest doing it in every patient before you start the treatment. So TPT initiation, monitoring, management of the adverse drug reactions, declaring treatment outcomes, and long-term follow-up will now be the responsibility of the doctor at the healthcare facility. So in the end, the onus is always on the treating doctor as per the guidelines. So what are the regimens we have? Now, I'm just going to be talking mostly about the regimens we have in India. Now, the CDC has few other regimens too. All countries have their own regimens, but basically it consists of a combination for drug-sensitive TB. It consists of a combination of either isoniazid alone or isoniazid with one of those rifamycins. Okay, so isoniazid prophylaxis in persons living with HIV and children less than five, or it used to be six years before, with history of pulmonary TB contact has been the most used uh, prophylactic regime in the national program. And now what they want to do is shift it from a longer to a shorter regime. Now this profile axis is for six months. Um, if we give a shorter regime, which includes rifamycin, that means either rifapentin or rifampicin based, these are can be less toxic and they can have better treatment completion rates because patients will most likely take it as it's not a daily um, tablet that they have to take and the adherence could be more. So there are two options, like I've said, six months of isoniazid or three months of weekly dose of rifapentin and isoniazid for persons over the age of two years. Rifapentin has a long t half, so it can be given once a week, and um, but it's not to be given in pregnant ladies. It's not to be given in children uh, less than two years either. So in such patients, we cannot give this combination. 
So we have a target population that I've already um, enumerated. We have persons living with HIV, infants less than 12 months in contact with HIV, and household contacts below the age of five of community TB patients. And such patients, what used to be given was six months daily isoniazid therapy. Now we can give three months of weekly isoniazid and rifapentin in patients older than two years. Similarly, in household contacts of five years and above of our pulmonary TB patients, whenever testing is possible, you should test for latent infection and, of course, rule out active infection. If that is done, they can be given a choice of taking three-month weekly isoniazid and rifabentin therapy. And if they cannot be given that because of certain reasons, then you have to give six months of daily isoniazid therapy. In other uh, groups, um, you have um, immunosuppressed therapy patients, the silicosis, anti-TNF, alpha, and dialysis, and transplantations, like I quoted before. The treatment regime remains the same. This is the dose. Um, now, six months of isoniazid therapy, we know that the isoniazid dose is five milligrams per kg per day in uh, children older than 10 years. In less than 10 years, because of the high metabolism, you have to give a slightly higher dose of 10 mg per kg per day. Now, the three months of weekly rifapentin plus isoniazid combination, that makes it 12 doses in total. Okay, And it's HP is what is denoted. H is for isoniazid and P is for rifapentin. So this is based on the weight of the patient. So you have tablets of isoniazid 100 mg milligrams and rifapentin of 150 milligrams. And based on the weight, that is the 5 5 interval, you have 10 to 15 kg, 16 to 23, 24 to 30, 31 to 34, and more than 34 kg. This is in two to four years, 14 years. And age more than 14 years, you have tablet formulations of isoniazid where you have a tablet of 300 mg and rifapentin of 150 mg. Soon the um, program uh, is going to come out with fixed up combinations like you have for, you know, even treatment of TB. So that's going to have 150 mg of isoniazid and 150 mg of rifapentin. So that's means you can give a maximum dose of 750 mg of both in a patient of 2 to 14 years may weighing more than 34 kg. In a patient more than 14 years, more than the highest weight band is for more than 70 kg, you can give a maximum dose of 900 milligrams of isoniazid and 900 milligrams of rifapentin in a fixed dose combination three times, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, once in a week for three months. So, um, uh, this is again the now this is just comparing the two doses so you have INH prophylaxis which is given for six months the other is for three months the advantages of the rifapentin plus isoniazid is that it's weekly the doses are less you only have 12 doses whereas 182 in the case of INH uh, mono INH, uh, just INH therapy the pill burden is 182 pills in um, in the uh, the H plus P it's nine pills with loose drugs and if you have the FTC pills it becomes 36 pills however in pregnant women we don't know the status we and we haven't used rifapentin in pregnant ladies, so we should not be using this. There are interactions with antiretroviral. Now, because the main target population is persons living with HIV, this is contraindicated in all persons receiving protease inhibitor and the nevirapine and NNRTI. So, but the current um, guy, uh, uh, ART regime, uh, you can use a rifapentin along with INH without dose adjustment. But if there's any drug resistant cases of HIV, yes, you must clarify it and then rule out that it doesn't interact with rifapentin because rifapentin is a rifamycin and is a cytochrome, strong cytochrome inducer and may reduce the level of HIV medications. Toxicity. Now, hepatotoxicity is the main toxicity that is seen with both INH as well as rifamycins, but more in INH. And since we're giving it on a daily basis, hepatotoxicity is said to be more in six months of INH uh, therapy. Peripheral neuropathy, rash and GI upset are also common uh, toxicities. In the um, a weekly regime of isoniazid and rifapentin, there's flu-like syndrome, hypersensitive reactions, GI upset. These are mentioned, but they're very rare. Um, and since we're giving it once a week, the chances of hepatotoxicity is much less in such patients. Orange discoloration, discoloration of body fluids is invariably seen with all rifamycin. So there's no need for any stoppage or you know change of treatment. Patients just have to be counseled, and this has to be told before you start taking the treatment. Now, absorption, INH and rifampicin ideally are always given on an empty stomach, but oral rifapentin bioavailability is more and the peak con concentration is shown to be increased if it's given with a meal. So um, this is a CDC recommendation. I just want to make a note of this too, because we do have patients sometimes who come to us and, you know, who need to travel abroad. I, I've just recently had a patient who needs to go to the U.S. for further studies. So she was told to get an IGRA done. Now, when it comes positive, you cannot give um, uh, six months of INH because that is not, not what is accepted outside. But now the uh, three months of isoniazid plus rifapentin, which is also now given in India, is what the CDC always recommended um, as per the American guidelines. So the 
prefer, they have five, um, you know, um, preferred five treatment regimes uh, for TPT. So the three preferred ones are three months of isoniazid plus rifapentin that's given once weekly, which has strong recommendation. That is what we're going to be following too. Or if not, they can be given four months of rifampicin or three months of rifampicin plus isoniazid given daily. Now, these two are given daily. Only the first one is given weekly. The alternative therapy is what we have six months of isoniazid or nine months of isoniazid given daily, but this is slowly being phased out. So now the dose of rifampicin in such a regime, adults is 10 milligram per kg and children is a little higher, 15 to 20 milligrams per kg per day. So let's quickly talk about the um, adverse effects of isoniazid and the rifamycin because it is important. Isoniazid, the main uh, side effect that you will see is an asymptomatic elevation of serum liver enzymes. Now, when is this important? What you should be looking at is the serum bilirubin uh, concentration, as well as the ASD uh, or the SCOT and the ALD, which is SGPT levels. Now, you always must get a baseline then. Although the uh, guidelines doesn't say you need to do a baseline LFT before starting TPT, I would advise always get a baseline then because we don't know which patients may... Uh, you know, um, uh, worsen, and it's always uh, the hepatitis is, is based upon the base the baseline level of the ASD and ALT. So, if there's a three times more um, elevation of the serum enzymes, the liver enzymes, as compared to the baseline, and the patient has symptoms of hepatitis, that is vomiting, nausea, yellowness of sclera, uh, loss of appetite, then it is significant, and you have to stop the treatment. Or if the patient has five times the elevation of the serum liver enzymes but doesn't have any symptoms, this is also important. So you must always look for hepatitis in these patients and peripheral neuropathy is also a very common known side effect of isoniazid. This is seen more in patients of malnourishment. Um, so, uh, but it must be asked for. Uh, symptoms of paresthesia, numbness, limb pain, health must be asked for. Re skin rash, sleepiness, lethargy, convulsions, pellagra, arthralgia are all um, rare symptoms that may occur. But the main thing you have to keep in mind is your um, hepatitis and your peripheral neuropathy. Now, the rifamycins we're talking about are the rifampicin. What we have here is rifapentin. So we'll just concentrate on that. Mainly the same thing, you have gastrointestinal reactions. You can have hypersensitive reactions, which are more common with the rifamycin as compared to isoniazid. So, um, and uh, rifampicin is notorious for causing decrease in white blood cell count and, you know, causing pancytopenia and also hepatitis, but it's seen less in weekly dose of rifapentin. These are all the medications. This is all given in the guidelines, so I will not be elaborating. It'll take too long, but I, any... Uh, Drug history is very important when you start a patient because almost many, many drugs, including antiarrhythmics, many antibiotics such as macrolide, anticoagulants, anticonvulsants, antidepressants, antimalarials um, like quinine, antipsychotics, antiretrovirals such as protease inhibitors and NRTIs, azole antifungals, barbiturates, all these medications interfere, um, rifamycin, basically rifapentin also, may interfere with such medications. It's seen more in rifampicin definitely, but um, especially patients of um, childbearing age, females, uh, women who are taking hormonal contraception they must be told that the levels will go down when they're taking rifapentin. So you must give them some other form of contraception. So some special considerations, pregnant ladies can be given isoniazid and rifampicin, but not um, uh, rifamice, uh, rifapentin, sorry. Rifamycin uh, reduce the effect of hormonal contraceptives, like I mentioned. Rifampicin or rifapentin TPT regimen should not be co-administered, like I said, with protease inhibitors or nevirapine or NNRTIs. BCG vaccination can be given when the patient is on TPT. So a child who has been vac who needs vaccination can be given vaccination. Rifamycins reduce the concentration of many, med many medications, like I mentioned, including even hepatitis C drugs. And patients on drug uh, dependence, such as opium dependence, must be followed up strictly because, again, uh, the levels of um, the, you know, the, um, the drug may go down in the uh, patient and patients may exhibit signs of withdrawal. So such patients must be kept on close follow-up. This will be dealt with, sir, the context of DRTB, but I just want to make a few little mention of some salient points. Now, we know that monodrug resistant, multidrug resistant, pre XDR, XDRTB, XDRTB is extensively drug resistant TB, polydrug resistance are all serious forms of TB that take longer to treat, and the drugs for these treatment have more side effects. And it's shown that the prevalence of MDR-TB in uh, those with TBI are more than double among young among young people, that is younger than 15 years. And household contacts of patients with MDR or uh, rifampicin-resistant TB or h mono resistance are at higher risk of TBI than contacts exposed to drug-sensitive TB. However, but the risk of progression to the TB disease remains the same. I think this is mainly because the MDR or, you know, um, XDR-TB takes longer to treat. Even the intensive phase is much longer than a, um, uh, than a 
of drug sensitive case. So such patients will be throwing out the bacillus for a longer time as compared to a patient of drug sensitive TB. So such household contacts will have more exposure and may have a higher risk of TBI. So these are some determinants of the success of the program. So at the individual and the population level, the adherence is the most important. So if the patient is not adherent to the TPT course and the treatment completion, there's no point taking the treatment. So irregular or inadequate treatment reduces the protective efficacy of the regimen and poor adherence or early cessation of the treatment can potentially increase the risk of individuals developing TB, including drug resistant TB. So the efficacy as per the program is stated that if at least 80% of the doses are taken within 133% of the prescription duration of the regimen, then it may be efficacious. For example, I'll give you an example, like um, if you have six months of uh, daily hyacinicid. So the total duration is six months. The expected number of doses in this six months is 180. So even if the patient takes 144 doses within the expected 33% extra time, that is 239 days, within 239 days, it may be considered that it's a successful completion of the treatment. How do we monitor these patients? They have to be followed up every month in person or by video call. Patients with pre-existing liver disease or significant alcohol consumption, you have to check LFTs periodically. That means at least monthly. And uh, monitoring for breakdown to active TB during the TPT or post-TPT for long-term follow-up should be done in 6, 12, 18, and 24 months by the doctor or the staff in the hospital. So some closing remarks from my side, I want to just state that tuberculosis is everyone's problem. It is not just the WHO's problem. It's not the you know community medicine or the respiratory medicine's problem. It's every doctor and every person's problem actually. So we have to join together to help fight it in every way possible. So wherever you're working, please be vigilant towards the high risk patients who are most, more likely to progress to active TB in the near future. There are far, four cardinal symptoms of TB disease that is cough, fever, weight loss, and night sweats. But understand that there are many other signs and symptoms and active TB is very hard to rule out, especially extra pulmonary TB, which is a very big chunk of the TB population in our country. So if you can do check for the cervical lymphadenopathy, do look for axillary lymphadenopathy, do look for inguinal lymphadenopathy, at least get an L along with an x-ray, try to get an ultrasound abdomen also done and be very vigilant in your um, follow-ups of the patient. And if in any doubt, never hesitate to refer to the nearest medical college or to a chest physician in your town or city so the patient can be evaluated by a doctor that specialized in tuberculosis. I will leave you with this pertinent uh, saying uh, that Dr. Roberts uh, mentioned in his address in the Berlin Physiological Society on 24th March 1882. We know that 24 4th March is observed as World Tuberculosis Day. And he said this on that day, that if the importance of a disease for mankind is measured by the number of fatalities it causes, then tuberculosis must be considered much more important than those most feared infectious diseases such as plague, cholera, and the like. One in seven of all human beings dies from tuberculosis. Of course, this number has gone down drastically thanks to chemoprophylaxis and the chemotherapy that we have for TB. But I think his words still ring true and we must be very, very vigilant and um, understand tuberculosis. Thank you so much. I'd be more than happy to take questions. Thank you so much, ma'am, for your wonderful presentation related to the recent advances in treatment and management of TB infection. Now I request Dr. Sanjay Sinha to kindly take over the platform for his topic. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. We would uh, take the Q&A sections after uh, Dr. Sanjay. Sinha. Okay, thank you, Shubhi. Thank you, Dr. Srija. It was such a wonderful presentation. And you made my things much easier to make them understand. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'm just sharing my screen. Is it visible? Uh, yes, sir. The screen is visible. Okay. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, today is the day for the Latin TB. And uh, it is for the treatment of infection, both in drug-sensitive TB as well as uh, drug-resistant TB. So uh, what I am going to uh, make presentation, it is on the preventive treatment in DRTB contacts. And I am following the guidelines, uh, which is being followed in the country. So, a few definitions just to start with. The first is, uh, as Dr. Srija has already mentioned, uh, you must know what is a close contact and what is a household contact. So, a close contact, uh, a close contact is who is not in the household, but shares an enclosed space. 
so uh, there may be a member your neighbor he may be, uh, he may be coming to you just to have some discussion or playing cards or for anything for extended periods during, uh, during the day with the index tb patient during the three months before commencement of the current tb treatment episode so uh, the household contact is who is in the same house who is uh, living uh, in the same house as the index tb patient for one or more nights they are the household contacts so there is a difference between close contact as well as household contact now since i am dealing with the drug drug resistant tb we must know that uh, what is the resistance pattern uh, we have got two important drugs there are four, uh, five uh, first line uh, tb drugs uh, they are isoniazide rifampicin pyrazinamide dimetol and streptomycin injection but the two very important drugs are isoniazide and rifampicin so uh, we have got two type of resistance one is isoniazide resistant tb means a tb patient whose biological specimen is resistance to isoniazide but he is sensitive to rifampicin so this is the situation number 1 and the situation number 2 is multi drug resistance most of the time we use this uh, term very liberally means any patient of uh, any resistance we call them mdr but actually it is not so mdr means he is resistance to isoniazide and rifampicin both medicines both drugs with or without resistance to other first line drugs he may be resistance to ethambutol or sensitive it hardly matters but he is resistant to both h and r the next step is pre extensively drug resistance tb this is the new term uh, pre hdr uh, here we have got another drug that is known as fluoroquinolone so if the patient is resistance to h and r and fluoroquinolone he is uh, he is considered to be uh, suffering from pre hdr tb because uh, fq this fluoroquinolone medicines like uh, levofloxacin or moxifloxacin they are very important second line drugs and the third uh, the last term is extensively drug resistance tb xdr tb we were also using uh, this term previously but with the advent of newer drugs newer treatment regimens now this definition has been changed now it is mdr or rr tb plus resistance to any fluoroquinolone either levofloxacin or moxi and then at least one additional group a drug uh, the all the medicines for, uh, for the uh, for the uh, treatment of drtb they have been uh, divided into three groups a b c so the main group is a where we have got that uh, medicine bedapilene and linozolid so if the patient is resistance to all these then we call them xdrtb so with definition we can go ahead so what is the uh, since now we were uh, giving the treatment to the person suffering from drtb but now the program has also initiated uh, treatment in drtb contacts but it is not throughout the country it has started in a phased manner and now the trial is going on two states gujarat and uh, karnataka and then it will be uh, further extended to many other states so what is the rational the rational is uh, though uh, the mathematical modeling it suggests that three in every 1000 people they carry mdr tb infection the prevalence of mdr tb in those with tb infection is more than double among those younger than 15 years means more common in adults and then household contacts of patients with mdr and rr or h resistant patient they are at higher risk of tb infection than contacts exposed to drug sensitive tb so uh, the government uh, there was a who consolidated guideline on tb prevention uh, preventive TB, uh, treatment of 2020 and the government has followed uh, followed that guidelines and uh, this guideline was it was implemented in 2021 in the later months of 2021 so uh, there was a systematic review and meta analysis after that uh, it, it was found that there is a reduced risk of tb incidence with treatment for mdr tb infection 
and and also it suggested that if it, uh, it is effective in prevention of progression to mdr tb and this mdr tb incidence there was uh, the reduction was 90% from five studies actually uh, there was 10 studies uh, it was conducted but actually uh, the uh, in another five studies the number the number of sample or the number of uh, the number of people it was quite less so those five were discarded and uh, and considering uh, considering the study from these five years, uh, five studies it was thought that it is uh, it is proper to have this uh, uh, preventive treatment also for the drug resistance tuberculosis and uh, in this preventive treatment pyrazinamide was not included because it was found that the rate of adverse effect, it was quite high who were having this pyrazinamide. So WHO, right now we don't have too much of evidence. So different studies are in pipeline. So uh, right now WHO has recommended TPT only for two conditions. One is MDR-TB with FQ sensitive, means if, uh, if I am rifampicin resistance or if I am HNR resistance, both, but I am sensitive to fluoropililones, then I am eligible for this preventive treatment. The other is I am resistance to isoniazide, but sensitive to rifampicin. So we have got uh, three medicines, levofloxacin, isoniazide, and rifampicin. So if I am MDRTB, but I am sensitive to fluoroquinolones. I will be given for six months for levofloxacin. If I am susceptible to isoniazide, but uh, I am uh, uh, confirmed rifampicin uh, resistant TB patient, I am eligible for six months of isoniazide. And if I am se uh, sensitive to rifampicin, but I am resistant to isoniazide, then I am eligible for rifampicin for four months. So right now, these three medicines, these three regimens, they are being uh, uh, they are being implemented. Mm -hmm. And uh, what Dr. Sirija told that you will have to follow the the patient clinically, whether he has, uh, uh, whether the patient is taking the uh, preventive treatment or not. We must follow them for at least two years just to see the recurrence. And the, there are three main studies in the pipeline. One is known as TB Champ. Here, here they are comparing the placebo with six months of levofloxacin in infants and less than five years of age exposed to MDRTB. The other study is known as VQueen, where they are uh, giving 24 weeks of levofloxacin versus placebo, and it is in all ages. And the other study is known as Phoenix, where they are giving 26 weeks of delaminid versus isonex, because right now we are giving isoniazide. So instead of isonex, they are giving their delaminate in, in all the age groups. So these are the different studies going on. This has been discussed by Dr. Srija. Uh, this is the integrated algorithm. You must see that uh, the contact, uh, the, the most important thing is counseling. So uh, we must counsel all the contacts and then we, uh, we should go for the screening. So whether uh, they are symptomatic or no, uh, uh, asymptomatic, if they are symptomatic, then we go. Then we uh, test for tuberculosis. If they are, if they are not symptomatic, it's okay. So uh, if they are symptomatic, we test for DSTB or DRTB. If it is DSTB, treat for DSTB. If they are, if it is DRTB diagnosed, then treat for drug resistance tuberculosis. Now, if they are not symptomatic, now we have got two age groups: less than five years and more than five years. If less than five years we should go for TPT. So yeah, we will find if the, if the TPT, is, uh, TPT is contraindicated, don't give it. If it is not contraindicated, give the TPT. If it is more than five years, as Dr. Sriza told that we must go for uh, some investigation and the, it is TST or IGRA. If the, uh, if the uh, negative, uh, we must uh, then follow up the uh, patient for active TB whenever necessary and if it is uh, if it is if these tests are positive then we go for screening by x-ray and then the chest physician or any mm. physician he he sees that whether the x-ray is normal 
or it is abnormal. If it is abnormal, then again investigate for tuberculosis. If it is normal, then think for whether the patient is eligible, uh, sorry, whether the contact is eligible for TP, uh, TPT or not. So this is a very simple integrated algorithm. So uh, what are the salient features? Once a DRTB patient is identified, all household contacts, they are counseled, screened, and evaluated. We must rule out active TB before giving TPT, whether it is drug resistance or it is drug sensitive. And for these household contacts, we should not go for sputum uh, examination, uh, sputum microscope yeah, by uh, uh, microscopy. We should go for nucleic acid amplification test. Right now, it is uh, available in all the states, in uh, 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 either as uh, TrueNet or as CVNet. So we should go for upfront testing for these contacts. So once we go for test then we will have uh, the result, whether it is MTB detected with no resistance or MTB detected with H or R resistance. If it is MTB detected with no resistance, then we start the treatment for DSTB because MTB has been detected. And if the MTB has been detected with some resistance, we manage the patient as per the guidelines. Now the question is, if the MTB is not detected in the context, then we see whether it is more than five years or less than five years. If it is less than five years, again, uh, what we have seen, we must access for TPT and see whether there is any contraindication or not, and then go for treatment. In the, uh, in the household contacts, more than five years of age, with uh, TB infection, test positive or unavailable, and chest X-ray is normal or unavailable, check for any contraindication. The thing is, if the test, has, uh, if the test are positive, uh, and if, if the facility for X-ray is not available, then still we can go for uh, this TPT. Then, uh, uh, so the policy, the policy is uh, for the preventive treatment, uh, it, is, it is household contacts of MDR-TB index patient in which uh, fluorochloroquine resistance has been ruled out. It is very, uh, very much important. And the number two is H resistance index patient in whom R resistance has been ruled out. So these are our two, uh, two uh, uh, category where we will give TPT for DRTB, for, for contacts of DRTB patients. This is the regime. Uh, the first is six, uh, six months of levofloxacillin. This is for contacts of R resistance and fluoroquinolone sensitive patients. So it's very much clear that the uh, contacts he must not be having any fluoroquinolone sensitive, uh, uh, sorry, fluoroquinolone resistance. And we have got then age, age uh, means uh, we decide the dose by the age and the weight. The age are, uh, the, uh, the contact may be more than 14 years or, or he may be less than 15 years. Uh, if, if it is more than 14 years by body weight, whether, uh, whether uh, the contact is less than 45 kg or more than 45 kg. Then the doses are 750 milligram per day and one gram per day. If the age is less than 15 years, then by body weight, we have got uh, this four type of weight band, five to nine kg, one, one weight band, 10 to 15 kg, 16 to 23 kg, 24 to 34 kg. So we must give the uh, medicine as per the weight bands. And uh, the doses are different, 150 milligram per day, 200 to 300 milligram per day. Uh, which you are uh, just observing in this slide. So this is for rifampicin resistance and fluoroquinolone sensitivity. The other group is isonex, uh, isonia, uh, isoniazide resistance and rifampicin sensitivity. So the rifampicin is still acting. So in those cases, it is given four months of rifampicin. Here the age is 10 years or more or less than 10 years and the dose is 10 milligram per kg per, per day. Uh, so it has to be decided by the treating physician. Uh, uh, there, uh, uh, there, there, there will be the provision for uh, dispersible lipo, lipofloxacin 100 milligram tablets so that it can be easily taken by the children also. The uh, dose of rifampicin, it should not be more than 600 milligram per day. That is the maximum. And uh, if the, uh, if the, uh, six, uh, six, uh, six months of isonics 
it can also be considered if the uh, patient is RRTB with fluoroquinolone sensitive with isoniazide sensitive. In that case, we can also consider isoniazide for six months. Once we start the treatment, we must uh, monitor the uh, treatment. So uh, the main concern is whether the patient is uh, uh, is going to be uh, going to become a uh, case of TB or not. So always go for the screening with four symptoms. Uh, it is cough, fever, night sweats, and weight loss. Just uh, also monitor whether the uh, whether these uh, contacts they are having any side effects or not. We should not use the term patient. If any of the signs symptoms of TB is emerging, he must be referred to the DRTB center for further evaluation for active TB and disease. Or uh, he may also be referred to a physician in the periphery. In the periphery. And uh, he must be subjected, he or she must be subjected to NAT and LPA. LPA is line probe assay. It is another molecular test where we know that the, uh, that the uh, person is sensitive to isoniazide or rifampicin or resistance to isoniazide or rifampicin. Then uh, what is the adherence plan? Adherence is very, uh, very much important because we have seen in the field that uh, they used to ask, the, that I have got no, no disease, then why you are giving me treatment? Basically in the adults. So uh, in that case, the counseling is very important. And once we start, we see that the adherence to the TP course, uh, TPT course and treatment completion is uh, done because irregular or in inadequate treatment, it will reduce the protective efficacy of the TPT regimen. So we must always keep uh, uh, counseling the, uh, the, the person to complete the treatment and take the medicines regularly. Then uh, it can only be done with the support of the family member, as well as the health worker nearby to the house of that person. Then uh, it will be uh, the, uh, the program, the TB elimination program of the country. They are, they are providing support to the index patient. It is known as a treatment supporter. So the same treatment supporter he will also he or she will also be providing support to the to these people who will be taking TPT, and then we can also monitor by using uh, like uh, uh, telecalls, video calls, then counting uh, empty blisters that how much uh, isoniazide or levofloxacin you have consumed, and refill monitoring whether the uh, whether the person is coming again or not to strengthen the adherence monitoring. So adherence is very important factor, and uh, then. Uh, the, uh, what is the criteria for completion of TPT? As uh, Dr. Sriza has already uh, described for the, the DSTB patients. So we know that it is uh, six months of levofloxacin. So the duration is six months. That, that uh, comes to 180 days. So 180 doses. So now the program is telling that even if the person is taking 80% of those, then we can count it uh, completed. But that 80% of dose, it must be completed within the treatment duration plus 33% additional time. It is not like that uh, in one year he is going to complete, no. So for levofloxacin, the duration is uh, 180 dose. So 80% becomes 144 dose. So if the person is completing 144 dose in 239 days, then it is, uh, uh, it is considered to be completed. Similarly, for the rifampicin, its dose is for uh, four, uh, four months or 120 doses. The 80% is 96 doses. So if 96 dose is completed in 160 days, then it is considered to be completed. Then uh, since we are using levofloxacin, there, there may be some uh, adverse events like no, uh, uh, nausea, diarrhea, headache, dizziness, uh, light headaches, uh, or trouble sleeping, or it may be uh, there. So in that case, if there, if there is a problem, uh, the, the person should be referred to a uh, nearby physician or any specialist he wants to. And if there is any uh, serious side effects, like uh, some bruising, bleeding, uh, or any uh, renal problems, then uh, or any liver problems, then again, he must be sent to the treating physician or any chest, chest or uh, uh, respiratory medicine specialist or pulmonary medicine specialist. So 
uh, there are various you know, the very serious side effect is uh, it is uh, the, it may be a tear of aorta aorta is the main artery and there may be irregular heartbeat so in that case and also certain uh, severe pain in the stomach chest back or cough it is due to tearing of the aorta so in that case uh, he must be referred immediately to the uh, any hospital where the proper care to be uh, uh, the proper care will be taken then if the patient is having any pain in the stomach uh, we should not use anti diarrheal or opioid uh, medication because it has been found that it uh, it has further worsened the situation uh, some may have some oral thrust or a, 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 a infection by the yeast so the uh, if the uh, if the patient is female we should also uh, uh, see for the vaginal discharge whether uh, uh, there is any sign of fungal infection or not rifampicin as you, uh, as you know the most important it is uh, nausea and vomiting some may have, some may have abdominal pain and the long term is hepatitis the other thing the other uh, adverse events are not so common and the most common is discoloration of body fluids so we must tell the patient before giving rifampicin that the color of the body fluids it will change to orange then uh, there are uh, there will be many person who will interrupt the uh, treatment so what should we do for them so we have got three medicines 6h 6, uh, six uh, levofloxacin and four months rifampicin so now the uh, duration of interruption it is of two types whether the patient has taken medicine for uh, uh, less than two weeks or more than two weeks if the person has taken uh, the medicine for the uh, for less than two weeks and he is coming to you then uh, nothing to do just uh, just continue with the uh, with the treatment and all those missed doses suppose he has missed for seven days or uh, four days then just add another four days of medicines means uh, the duration will be it will be 180 180 doses but it will be completed in 184 days or 187 days whatever the interruption may be if the person is coming who has taken uh, whose interruption is more than 2 weeks then we will see that whether they, uh, he has taken more than 80% of doses or less than 80% of doses if he has taken already more than 80% of doses then we should continue and complete the remaining treatment doses in the course same is if it is less than 80% of doses then we will see what is the treatment uh, treatment duration plus 33% of additional time as we discussed earlier in that case we will continue and complete the remaining treatment doses in the course if it is less than 80% of do uh, doses expected in the regimen uh, were taken and the treatment course cannot be completed within expected time like uh, 139 days or something like that then we should start the uh, uh, refresh means uh, Uh, we should forget the previous doses and we should start again for that that person it, uh, since we have uh, initiated medicines the treatment so there must be a treatment outcome for that so what are the treatment outcome of the tb preventive treatment so when will uh, when we will tell that the uh, patient has completed the treatment so as discussed earlier we have got six uh, uh, we have got six months of isoniazide six months of uh, levofloxacin and four months of rifampicin so uh, if he uh, if he if he has completed 144 uh, doses of levoflux sorry isoniazide in in 239 doses or 144 doses of uh, levofloxacin in six months uh, uh, in in 239 doses then we uh, then we call it as a treatment completed and for the rifampicin it should be it should be 96 doses it should be completed within 160 days then we call it treatment completed the other uh, treatment outcomes are treatment failed like uh, uh, if the person is uh, initiated on tpt and uh, during the course of this treatment he develops active tb disease then we call that this uh, tpt treatment has failed then died while uh, while during the uh, during this treatment if the person has died due to any reason 
not due to not due to tuberculosis he may he may have died in any road accident also then the outcome is called as died and the other is loss to follow means those person who have interrupted the treatment so the, again there are two uh, two two points here if the if the person has interrupted for uh, for more than eight consecutive weeks more than two months it is uh, uh, for uh, means when he is when the treatment duration is uh, six months either it is for isoniazide or for the levofloxacin if that person he has interrupted the treatment for more than eight weeks then he is known as loss to follow up in the case of 3 hp or in case of four months of pampicin this period is four consecutive weeks because here the duration of treatment is less then there may be uh, means while during the treatment the patient may have some adverse event maybe some toxicity like hepatitis or something like a, any any drug drug interaction then that tpt it may be discontinued and in that case the outcome will be tpt discontinuation due to toxicity then there may be some uh, uh, some people also that uh, after two or three months they must have migrated to some place and uh, and we don't know what happened to them in uh, in th in those cases the treatment outcome will be not evaluated so these are the treatment outcome once we have started so this is a, uh, a in very brief about the management of uh, um, latent tb in uh, drtb for the contacts so uh, the main thing is uh, we have to go for the prevention aspect also because we were uh, treating the disease since last so many years but uh, if we if you really want to eliminate the tuberculosis we have to treat the latent tb also so then only we are, the tb can be uh, uh, eliminated from the country thank you thank you very much thank you so much sir for your wonderful presentation related to the recent advancements of tb now i would like to request dr shrija to the platform for the q and a section most of the questions are being answered by ma'am uh, yeah sorry i couldn't control myself i just yeah, thought no, of it <laughs> no problem ma'am there are some questions which i received personally so i would like to take up that questions uh, so ma'am uh, what would be the gold uh, tb test that is being is it being banned and what are being what are their standards related to that no quantifron gold is actually um it's not supposed to be used for diagnosis of tb it's not banned as such but yes it is not you cannot take a quantifron gold test and say i want to start treatment for tb now as per the guidelines it can be used for latent tb or tb infection just to guide you whether you have been infected to the case okay so what has to be very clear is that doctor should not use it for diagnosis of tb so if you feel a person has tb you must work them up for tb per se so if you feel the patient has symptoms of fever cough to x ray kara lo x ray mein kuch nahi hai to get your sputum done sputum is foremost you have to get a sputum afp smear and gene expert cb nat is now the first line of treatment that has to be done if that comes negative still there are lesions on the chest x ray you must get a ct scan done if sputum if Uh, even after repeating once doesn't come positive you must go for further tests such as bronchoscopy and take out the alveolar lavage or the bronchial aspirate this is just for pulmonary cox now if you have other problems such as pot spine so if a patient has backache you must get the mri done at the back if you feel the patient has any swelling the swelling has to be palpated and fnc has to be done and sent for cytology and look for afp smear as well as for gene expert and mgit which is a culture So I'm just trying to say that this IGRA and TST are not banned per se, but they are not to be used for treatment. It's only used for detection of latent TB. Uh, so just to just to yes. summarize uh, what Dr. Sridha told, we should use this test only for diagnosis of infection of tuberculosis, not the disease, yes. and it is being used in the program. Okay. The, the 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 test which are banned initially, which was used like. Uh, IgG, IgG, IgM for diagnosis of tuberculosis. Those have been banned. So, sir, talking about IgA, so are these tests performed equally well in the persons related to HIV or any person who is immunosuppressed? Uh, or what could be the uh, clinical significance or the specificity of uh, IgA test? Uh, should I answer, sir? You. Yes, sir. Sure, please go. Yeah, ma'am, please. 
Uh, okay, so the thing is that um, now, Ikra, like I've stated, um, there are false positive results in this too. Now, the thing is that these tests, uh, it's, it's, an, it's an indirect test, right? It all depends on the immunity that's conferred by the patient. So you have this phenomena called energy and you have phenomena of compartmentalization. For example, a patient with extra pulmonary TB has pleural effusion. His TST or Ikra may come negative, though he has TB because all the lymphocytes are concentrated in the pleural effusion or the uh, you know, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the lymph nodes or the area of, uh, you know, where the fluid is. So it may come negative. So it's no standard thing that if it is negative that the patient doesn't have. So that's what, again, the question comes about active TB. So if now, if a patient is exposed, has a contact at home, has any type of immunosuppression, for example, if the patient has HIV, the patient anyway has a low immune level. So it's the immune cell lymphocytes that are going to be giving you the results. So if you have an immunosuppressed state, you will you might get a negative too. That's why TST value is actually 10, 10 millimeters for a normal person, but in immunocompromised individuals, even a 5 mm, they consider it as significant because they don't elicit that much of a, you know, um, a robust uh, reaction as compared to a person who is not immunosuppressed. So yes, it may come negative. It's not a false proof thing. So it may come negative. So then, of course, the question comes, does the patient want to take? If you have a contact of pulmonary TB in the house and you know for sure, but your ICRA comes negative, you're given a choice to the patient. So that's what the guidelines now say. If it's not available, you can still give the TPT provided you ruled out the disease. Thank you for your wonderful answer. Sir, would you like to add something, sir? Sanjay, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just want to say, means, uh, right now it is, it is being implemented in the country since last uh, more than five years. And the only thing is that uh, whenever PLHIV, they are coming to the ART centers, they are being screened for tuberculosis by the four symptom complex. So they are not, they are not going undergoing uh, IGRA test. And once uh, the TB has been ruled out, then they are being uh, given this IPT, means isoniazide preventive uh, treatment for six months. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So, sir, what would be the prevention protocol of a person who is working in closely with a TB patient, like a healthcare professional who is working closely with a TB patient. So how can it be prevented? So that's a question asked. <laughs> yeah, that's a uh, means very important question, which is being neglected in the uh, real practice. So there is one uh, thing is, it is known as airborne infection control. The first thing is, uh, means if you are a, uh, if you are a physician if you, and if you are seeing any patient, you must see that whether your chamber is well ventilated or not. If uh, the, the person who is coming, who is coughing, uh, he must have, he must be putting some mask on his uh, on his face, uh, and you just uh, means uh, don't have face to face with him. So this use of uh, mask it is very important thing, and and for the because we are susceptible to tuberculosis, we are working with the TB patient. So uh, right now we are in the vulnerable group also. So we should be screened for TB also, I'm, uh, at least annually, by uh, by the symptoms, by the X-ray. Okay. Definitely, sir. So prevention is always better than cure. Yeah, yeah. I think Dr. Srida will add something more. Yeah. No, no, sir. I totally agree with you. And apart from the, like you said, um, well ventilated chambers with at least twelve to fifteen exchanges is what they say. And I feel even for respiratory residents who are, you know, performing procedures such as bronchoscopy, there's a, it's a high airborne, you know, high aerosol transmission. Now, in many of the times it's done in suites and in OT, and it's not really possible to have the air exchange. So I would say wear an N95 mask at all times. So some things, you know, and of course, keep a good immunity. You have to sleep well, eat well, exercise. At the end of the day, it's the immune system who can protect you. So yeah. <laughs> It is the first thing when say, uh, we are told that uh, whenever you are going to uh, hospital, you must have something inside your right. stomach. Uh, <laughs> it, it, uh, it should not be empty. And uh, like Corona has taught, uh, uh, taught us very good thing to use the mask. Yes, sir. Very true, sir. Uh, so, sir, talking about COVID, so can COVID-19 uh, increase the risk of reactivation of latent TB? Yeah, sure. So that's why uh, now the government has issued a direction for the bi-directional screening. So all those, all those percent who were tested for COVID, their samples should also be tested for tuberculosis. And it has been found that uh, in those cases, uh, patient has also been diagnosed as a case of tuberculosis. Uh, so ma'am, any insights regarding that? 
Uh, what Sir said is very true. Now, as per guidelines, you any patient uh, of, you know, SARI, you have to test. If the COVID is positive, you have to test for TB. And ideally, TB patients may be COVID check. Karna hai. So you have to do that. And yes, it has been seen like I've been dealing with COVID since the pandemic. And I've seen many patients come with reactivation of TB. I think it's because of that transient immunosuppression that happens in COVID. So yes, many patients who recover do exhibit signs of TB within one to two months. Yeah. Again, it's all due to the immune phenomena. So. Yeah, as you said, immunity matters a lot. Yeah. Uh, so, ma'am, just taking up the last question. So, uh, we talked about TST, tuberculin uh, skin test. So, what is the uh, relativity and specificity of TST as compared to uh, IGRA? Now, TST is a test that is uh, very um, subjective, okay? So it has to be done intradermally. A wheel has to be created. If it is done exactly as, uh, you know, it's supposed to be, if the PPD is not within, it's not expired, if it's a five tuberculin unit, then it is as sensitive as an IGRA. It's not It's not inferior to an IGRA, but it's not as specific um, because it, 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 it uh, so a person who has been recently um, vaccinated with BCG or a patient who harbors a non-tubricular mycobacteria in even in those patients it may come positive so sensitivity is almost the same it's more than 90 percent sensitive but specificities is a little lower than ICRA. and also uh, uh, means in, the, uh, also in, uh, in our country where more than 40 percent of population they are infected so in adult uh, it should not be used for diagnosis of tuberculosis yes it's, it's not to not be used in diagnosis ICRA and tst should not be used for diagnosis it's only for later tb uh, thank you, ma'am. That was indeed a wonderful session for Q&A. Thank you, sir, for your time. Thank you, ma'am. With this, I would now like to proceed for vote of thanks. By the time we have raised post poll, I request every participant to kindly submit their polls by the time I proceed with the vote of thanks. So with gratitude and immense pleasure, I would now like to thank Dr. Sanjay Kumar Sena and Dr. Shreeja Naya for sharing their valuable opinion on TB awareness and survivorship. We really are in a dire need for spreading this information across the community. I would like to thank uh, Beatrice for supporting us over this and thank you all the participants for being a patient audience and being with us. So we have a series of upcoming uh, CMEs on breast and prostate oncology and tuberculosis. To keep yourself updated, please subscribe to our newsletter and like and subscribe us on Facebook, Telegram, LinkedIn and Instagram. Thank you, ma'am, and thank you, sir, for your valuable thank you. time. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You, sir. Thank you, Suvi, and thank you, Srija, for such an Thank you so much, sir. It was wonderful yeah. interacting with you, too. Thank you so thank much you. to the audience yeah. as well. I had lots. Yeah. We learned a lot, too, I think, by interacting. Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you so much, Dr. Shubhi. Thank, thank you, you ma'am. Bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.